Friends, I am Dr. Amdekar and we must remember that there are no routine tests in clinical practice because every test must be with a specific purpose. And in this video, I am going to recap all such important messages that my colleagues gave over the last seven videos. In the first video, Dr. Palne Raman talked about urinalysis and we know obviously that whenever there is an edema, uh, hypertension, any suggestion of a renal disorder or maybe blood in the urine or jaundice, a urine examination is called for. But most important is an acute onset of high fever with toxicity, especially in infants or young toddlers, should not be missed because it could be an acute pyelonephritis and a routine urine examination supplemented by urine culture is extremely important before one starts an antibiotic. When it comes to microscopic examination interpretation, we are all aware that few pustules do not mean anything much and so also a few RBCs. But if there are 10 or more RBCs, one may consider further investigation for hematuria. And then of course the biochemical test, today which can be done even with a routine strip test, which tells you a lot about all common urinary findings that one likes to know, like glucose, protein, uh, pustules, etc. And I think in the next video, uh, Dr. Anjali talked about the stool analysis and she emphasized how useful or not useful it could be. I think macroscopic examination of the freshly passed stool gives a lot of information because it could show blood and mucus, it could also show a large volume of stool which is grey-white color, badly smelling and it could mean a fat malabsorption or even a giardiasis. But when it comes to stool microscopy, again a macrophages and several pus cells may indicate an inflammation and one may have to decide between an inflammatory bowel disease and an acute bacillary dysentery. But the stool also could be considered for any occult blood, like uh, sometimes it may not be visible and you can pick it up by the test and so also the test for malabsorption typically a fat malabsorption, where a cumbersome test for 24 hours collection can be now easily possible by doing what is known as an acidic steatoric test. And I think a mere presence of fat globules in the stool may also justify further investigation for malabsorption. In the next video, Dr. Tushar Maniar talked about blood sugar and friend this is important because hypoglycemia may exist without much obvious clinical symptoms and in every situation of seriousness like an ICU situation or a neonatal infection or neonatal sickness or even a neonate who has at risk of hypoglycemia a blood sugar is important and so also in a PEM for example or Sometimes when you suspect an inborn error of metabolism, uh, blood sugar would be an important investigation. And at the same time, in obesity, blood sugar really predicts whether you are likely to be diabetic and in obvious diabetic situation, hyperglycemia. But in an occasional ICU situation, there could be hyperglycemia as well, which may need an intervention and hence the blood sugar examination is often commonly asked in such serious situations. In the next video, I discuss about the liver function test and we are all aware that largely the function of the liver is production of various types of proteins as well as bile and of course the metabolism. And the commonly used tests are serum bilirubin, enzymes like ALT, AST, alkaline phosphatase and GTT and also the albumin globulin and finally the prothrombin time. Friends, it's simple to interpret the, these tests. A bilirubin tells you the extent of the disease because unless 80-85% of hepatocytes are damaged, you don't see the bilirubin in the blood and therefore it suggests an extent of the disease. When you are talking about ALT, AST, they are increased in large number, especially in acute hepatocyte disease and therefore they suggest an acuity of the disease. However, if they are mildly increased, then it means a chronic hepatitis.
hepatocyte disease. It's also important to look at ALT and AST together because AST higher than ALT may suggest a systemic disorder affecting also the hepatocytes. And then of course low albumin uh, suggests a chronic hepatocyte disorder and then a prothrombin tells you the seriousness of the disease. Thus, the extent of the disease, acuity or chronicity of the disease and the seriousness of hepatocyte disease are all easily interpretable by a commonly used liver function test. Thereafter, Dr. Chokani talked about the renal function test and we know glomerular filtration is one of the important aspects and today we could consider eGFR, estimated GFR, which can be calculated roughly by the height in centimeters divided by serum creatinine into a constant which is 0.5 taken for convenience. It could vary a little, but this gives you an idea of eGFR and remember GFR goes down from 120 ml to almost 30 or 40 ml per minute till then the serum creatinine does not rise and therefore serum creatinine is a late marker of a renal involvement. At the same time we know that uh, tubular functions are important for the kidneys and the proximal tubular functions uh, are really like a gatekeeper. It absorbs a large amount of uh, different substances like protein, glucose, a sodium bicarbonate and also large amount of water and therefore distal tubular functions are largely also considering some remaining water absorption but largely calcium magnesium etc and therefore indications for doing these renal function tests besides edema hypertension etc are also the renal tubular disorders like uh, oliguria polyuria and the failure to thrive these are the reasons why you pick it up and also the metabolic acidosis. Therefore, these renal functions are important uh, to pick up a renal glomerular as well as a renal tubular and one may consider some other findings uh, like other tests like maybe a beta 2 microglobulin etc. Thereafter, Dr. Kare discussed about the thyroid problem and we are all aware that we must diagnose congenital hypothyroidism at birth and that can be done by the cord blood screening. And it's important that uh, the maternal hypothyroidism which is reasonably well controlled does not affect the fetus at all but in case in the first trimester of pregnancy the mother has not realized the hypothyroidism nor the doctor then it is likely that the fetus may develop a congenital hypothyroidism because in the first trimester of pregnancy the fetus depends only on maternal thyroxine and when it comes to really the hyperthyroidism again a free T4 is much more specific for both hypo and hyperthyroidism and a TSH certainly could give us an idea whether you are hitting for a hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. And I think when you look at the maternal hyperthyroidism, there is a risk of a fetal hypothyroidism and therefore a subsequently hypothyroidism after birth because the antibodies cross the placenta and so also the anti-hyperthyroid drugs also cross the placenta and these are the important issues for interpretation of a T4, T3 and TSH. In the last video of this series, Dr. Mahesh Mohite talked about serum electrolytes. Friends, when serum electrolytes are deranged, it's not easy to pick up clinically unless it's an isolated hyponatremia or a hypokalemia. But otherwise, being a complex situation of metabolic disorders, one needs to use serum electrolytes as a pretty common test. And he emphasized how pseudo-hyponatremia or a pseudo-hypokalemia can easily be mistaken for a genuine one. And then when it's a hyponatremia, uh, one may have to also consider many other situations like a salt losing variety or SIADH and so on and so forth. And he made an emphasis that uh, hyponatremia is a very common feature of multiple serious illnesses including simply an acute pneumonia for example where 
clinically it may not be manifesting but hyponatremia is a common denominator of many sick patients and therefore it's a very common test employed in uh, ICU setting. Same is true about hypernatremia because you may have an irritability like in diabetes insipidus and one needs to pick it up early and therefore serum electrolytes are important as far as sodium is concerned but also potassium because a hypokalemia is also a common feature of multiple problems and therefore serum electrolytes is a very common usually uh, important for sick patients. Having discussed all this, I'm sure you have been enjoying our YouTube and now in the next series, we are really going to pick up imaging tests as well as some not uncommon tests that are still useful in clinical practice. I hope you continue joining us. Thank you.